To best understand the Anglo-American Empire, the United Nations Agenda 21 protocols working for a world government, your best source material comes from an insider by the name of Carol Quigley, who was the professor of, I believe, political science at Georgetown University. He mentored Bill Clinton, among others. And he wrote the pivotal work, Tragedy and Hope, in 1966. In 1981, he completed the Anglo-American establishment. Here is the introduction. The Rhodes Scholarships, established by the terms of Cecil Rhodes' Seventh Will, are known to everyone. What is not so widely known is that Rhodes, in five previous wills, left his fortune to form a secret society, which was to devote itself to the preservation and expansion of the British Empire. And what does not seem to be known to anyone is that this secret society was created by Rhodes and his principal trustee, Lord Milner, and continues to exist to this day. To be sure, this secret society is not a childish thing, like the Ku Klux Klan, and it does not have any secret robes, secret hand clasps, or secret passwords. It does not need any of these since its members know each other intimately. It probably has no oaths of secrecy, nor any formal procedure of initiation. It does, however, exist and holds secret meetings, over which the senior members present presides. At various times since 1891, these meetings have been presided over by Rhodes himself, Lord Milner, Lord Selborne, Sir Patrick Duncan, Field Marshal Jan Smuts, Lord Lothian, and Lord Brand. They have been held in all the British dominions, starting in South Africa about 1903, in various places in London, chiefly 175 Piccadilly, at various colleges at Oxford, chiefly All Souls, and at many English country houses, such as Tring Park, Blickling Hall, Cliveden, and others. This society has been known at various times as Milner's Kindergarten, as the Round Table Group, as the Rhodes Crowd, as the Times Crowd, as the All Souls Group, and as the Cliveden Set. All of these terms are unsatisfactory for one reason or another, and I have chosen to call it the Milner Group. Those persons who have used other terms or heard them used have not generally been aware that all these various terms referred to the very same group. It is not easy for an outsider to write the history of a secret group of this kind, but since no insider is going to do it, an outsider must attempt it. It should be done, for this group is as I shall show, one of the most important historical facts of the 20th century. Indeed, the group is of such significance that evidence of its existence is not hard to find. This evidence I have sought to point out without overly burdening this volume with footnotes and bibliographical references. Since such evidences of scholarship are kept at a minimum, I believe I have given the source of every fact which I mention. Some of these facts came to me from sources which I am not permitted to name, and I have mentioned them only where I can produce documentary evidence available to everyone. Nevertheless, it would have been very difficult to write this book if I had not received a certain amount of assistance from a personal nature from persons close to the group. For obvious reasons, I cannot reveal the names of such persons, so I have not made reference to any information derived from them 
unless it was information readily available from other sources. I feel that there is no doubt at all about my general interpretation. I also feel that there are a few misstatements of fact, except in one most difficult matter. This difficulty arises from the problem of knowing just who is and who is not a member of the group. Since membership may not be a formal matter, but based rather on frequent social association, and since frequency of such association varies from time to time and from person to person, it is not always easy to say who is in the group and who is not. I have tried to solve this difficulty by dividing the group into two concentric circles, an inner core of intimate associates who unquestionably knew that they were members of a group devoted to a common purpose, and an outer circle of larger number, on whom the inner circle acted by personal persuasion, patronage distribution, and social pressure. It is used by a secret society. More likely they knew it, but, in English fashion, felt it discreet to ask no questions. The ability of Englishmen of this class and background to leave the obvious unstated, except perhaps in obituaries, is puzzling and sometimes irritating to an outsider. In general, I have undoubtedly made mistakes in my list of members, but the mistakes, such as they are, are to be found rather in my attribution of any particular person to the outer circle instead of the inner core, rather than in my connecting him to the group at all. In general, I have attributed no one to the inner core for whom I do not have evidence convincing me that he attended the secret meetings of the group. Of course, I have an attitude, and it would be only fair to state it here. In general, I agree with the goals and aims of the Milner Group. I feel that the British way of life and the British Commonwealth of Nations are among the great achievements of all history. I feel that the destruction of either of them would be a terrible disaster for mankind. I feel that the withdrawal of Ireland, of Burma, of India, or of Palestine from Commonwealth is regrettable and attributable to the fact that the persons in control of these areas failed to absorb the British way of life while they were parts of the Commonwealth. I suppose, in the long view, my attitude would not be far different from that of the members of the Milner Group. But agreeing with the group on goals, I cannot agree with them on methods. To be sure, I realize that some of their methods were based on nothing but good intentions and high ideals, higher ideals than mine, perhaps, but their lack of perspective in critical moments, their failure to use intelligence and common sense, their tendency to fall back on standardized social reactions and verbal cliches in a crisis, their tendency to place power and influence into the hands chosen by friendship rather than merit, their oblivion to the consequences of their actions, their ignorance of the point of view of persons in other countries or of persons in other classes in their own country. These things, it seems to me, have brought many of the things which they and I hold dear close to disaster. In this group, were persons like Escher, Gray, Milner, Hanke, and Zimmern, who must command the admiration and affection of all who knew them. As a result, several persons whom I place in the outer core, such as Lord Halifax, should probably be placed in the inner core. I should say a few words about my general attitude towards the subject. I approach this subject as a historian. This attitude I have kept, I have tried to describe or to analyze, not to praise or condemn. I hope that in the book itself, this attitude is maintained. On the other hand, in this group were persons whose lives have been a disaster to our way of life. Unfortunately, in the long run, both in the group and in the world, the influence of the latter kind has been stronger than the influence 
of the former. This has been my personal attitude. Little of it, I hope, has penetrated to the pages which follow. I have been told that the story I relate here would be better left untold, since it would provide ammunition for the enemies, of which I admire. I do not share this view. The last thing I should wish is that anything I write could be used by the Anglophobes and isolationists of the Chicago Tribune. But I feel that the truth has a right to be told, and once told, can be an injury to no men of good will. Only by a knowledge of errors of the past is it possible to correct the tactics of the future. Carol Quigley, 1949. Be the change you wish to see in the world. Go to wearechangect.org. Thank you for watching Truth Talk News, where news the mainstream media ignores is the top story. For more truth, subscribe to Freedom First Films on YouTube and Truth Talk News on Livestream.com. To best understand the Anglo-American Empire, the United Nation University, he mentored Bill Clinton, among others, and he wrote the pivotal work, Tragedy and Hope, in 1966. In 1981, he completed the Anglo-American Establishment. Here is the introduction. The Rhodes Scholarships, established by the terms of Cecil Rhodes' Seventh Will, are known to everyone. What is not so widely known is that Rhodes, in five previous wills, left his fortune to form a secret society, which was to devote itself to Agenda 21 protocols working for a world government. Your best source material comes from an insider by the name of Carol Quigley, who was the professor of, I believe, political science at Georgetown.